Hello, this is Alex Barbas, uh, founder of Aroka Press, and I'm here with Philip Campbell, the author of one of our newest books, The Way of Life. And I'm actually here at his house in Michigan. Um, We're chilling in the dining room. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he lives in the country. I'm a city boy, so he lives in the country. This is, uh, it's quite nice, actually. Um, but yeah, we're here to discuss his book, which uh, I think is is one of our great books of, of you know, Catholic spirituality that uh, I think would be of help to a lot of people. But um, Well, I'm really glad you're here. I love, I, I do a lot of interviews, and I always love when I get to do like a, a personal sit down with somebody. So uh, you were out in, uh, you... You're Canadian, and uh, you were crossing over to. Well, yeah. I am, I live in Canada, You're but a... I'm actually from from the states. Oh, that's right. You're yeah. a born Michigander. Right? I, I am, although I grew up in New York City. Um, yeah. But uh, I, yeah, I was born in Detroit. But I've lived in Canada for for four, almost 14 years now. So. Canadian now, but we met. Um, <laughs> yeah. We, we met for mass this morning at the uh, at the uh, Saint Joseph Shrine in Detroit. That's which right. Is run by the Institute. And uh, now we're out here in rural Michigan to chat about my book, and I'm so glad you're here. Really, it's it is a it is a great honor to to talk to you. Um, this, by the way, this is the first time I've ever done an interview like this. So, um, but uh, I'm... so make sure everyone leave mean comments. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oops. All right. Well, um, so the first thing I want to do is just ask you a few general questions. Yeah. Um, and then I'm going to get to specific questions about, you know, the chapters in this this really excellent book. Um, so first, tell us a, a bit about why you started writing on, well, spiritual topics, if you will, on your blog. Yeah, well, I, f I founded Unam Sanctam Catholicam years ago. Um, I actually founded it in 2004, but I didn't really start blogging out until 2007. And as many traditional Catholics at the time, I started as an outlet to gripe about things that, you know, kind of like, uh, why, like, Marty Hagen sucks. Like, why do I hear right. Marty Hagen at Mass? You know, like, where's the la you know, I used it to complain about, um, uh, to complain about problems in the church sure. because there was no real voice for that, you know, right. um, that I was aware of. But then eventually, as, as time went on, like, I guess spiritually, um, not that there's still things we couldn't complain about, <laughs> but, you know, I got to the point where I wanted to dig into some of the more meat of the spiritual life. And because um, ultimately, I've always believed that the faith is about is about transformation, you know, in the image of Christ. I wanted to dig down to some of that stuff. So I started writing about my own experiences and then kind of over time addressing other experiences that that I would see friends or people in my life going through and trying to to kind of help bring people some balance, not from the perspective of like a spiritual master, but just to try to sure. help them put things in perspective and find a, a, a balanced way to live the faith in their life. Yeah, I, I think you use the word balance. I think that's uh, one of the many things I took away from this book. And again, I'll get into it uh, in more detail, um, that you really want the reader of this, of this book to find balance amidst you know, this crisis, there is a crisis, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's hard not to say that there's a crisis, right? But um, I think you're right. A lot of people can lose focus. I know personally, if I'm not careful, I can easily lose my focus. So I think that's, that's a very interesting point you made. Um, so you've written a lot. Now, why did you choose these particular essays or articles for this book? What what struck you about those particular um, pieces? Yeah, of well, there there was a lot to choose from. I've done over uh, on the Unam Sanctam blog. There's over thirteen hundred essays, and then on the sister website, there's something like three or four hundred as well. So there's quite a bit to choose from, but I I picked ones that were really born of like uh, my own uh, kind of the depths of my own experience, like things that I suffered through or struggled through or things that other people were struggling through and I was trying to kind of hold their hand through it. Basically things that would would kind of reach out to the reader as having a uh, kind of like a, a personal um, depth to it. Right, right. Um, now, 
this is uh, kind of a, one of the first questions uh, I think I should ask is why the title The Way of Life? What, mm. What's the meaning behind that title? Well, in the literal sense, The Way of Life, uh, I took it from uh, the opening of the ancient Christian text, the Didache, which opens up by saying there are two ways, one of life and one of death, but there's a great difference between the two ways. Um, so it's literally taken from the Didache, but I'd been thinking about this a lot in the past few years, especially since the crisis in the church has amplified with the liturgical wars uh, since uh, Traditionis Custodis, and, um, and thinking about what it means to live the faith today in the church, in the secular world. And I was struck reading the New Testament how the New Testament doesn't use the word Christianity. Um, it calls the faith the way multiple times. And I go through it in the uh, in introduction to the book. Um, but, uh, for example, in, uh, in Acts 9-2, it says that Saul went to Damascus, quote, so that if he found any belonging to the way, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. And then also, uh, in, also in the book of Acts, it says that the Jews in Corinth quote, refused to believe and publicly maligned the way. And there's all these verses where the faith is called the way. And then even Jesus himself, we could go back to it like, I am the way, right. the, the truth and the life. And so I thought that's very interesting because there is a tendency in, uh, in Christianity to compartmentalize it, to think of, like, if you ask, what is Christianity? Like, well, is it a, is it a series of intellectual propositions? Is it a moral system? Is it a series of rituals? You know, like, is it a shared artistic and cultural heritage? Right. Is it a personal credo? Like, it, it's all of those things. But, like, I wanted to try to get a, a comprehensive take on it. Like, and, I, and this term really helped me, the way. A way is, like, something that you... It's it's so, a manner of being. Yeah, so it's know? it's it's totally encompassing the the, the uh, human being, right? He he has to um, see everything through. Well, I guess the the eyes of the faith. Is that kind of what you're getting at? Yeah, exactly. It's it's all in, it's kind of like a holistic view of uh, of the faith. And I also like the way that the uh, the concept of the way, um, it implies that, like when you're going somewhere, like the way is like the road that you're taking, mm -hmm. right? Like it is the path by which you, uh, by which you travel, but it's also the journey itself. Sure. You know, it's, yes. the, it's the, it's the direction you take and it's the act of, of going, like you go on your way, you know, yes. or you say, I'm taking that way. Uh, so I like that because that's the, that's one aspect of the Christian life. That's very important. Like the catechism says about the Eucharist, that's the source and the summit of the faith. It's the foundation from which we proceed and the place to which we're going. And I think the term way encompasses that, that it is the it is the path upon which we're on, but it's also the journey and it's the destination because Jesus Christ is the way. Mm. So uh, so that was my thinking in, in choosing this. Yeah, that that makes, makes a lot of sense. Um, and another thing I wanted to mention is you... Uh, your friend, uh, Dom Noah Morbeek, am I no. pronouncing his last name correctly? As far as I know. Okay. <laughs> so he does, he also has some, some essays in, or uh, essays in, in this book. Um, what, what connection do you have with him and, and, uh, why did you feel, you know, was something good to include some of his writing? Yeah, Dom Noah Morbeek, um, many, uh, many of your listeners, if, if anyone's been around online trad blogging for a while, they might know, okay. know uh, about uh, Dom Noah. Um, Dom Noah is a, a old friend of mine. Um, he is the uh, preceptor and novice master of the North Amer American Preceptory of the Militia Templi, which is um, commonly known as the Order of the Poor Knights of Christ, or the Revived Templars, the real Templars, okay. not the not uh, not the weird Masonic <laughs> sure. Templar or whatever. But um, I, Noah was instrumental in helping me found the original Unum Sanctum sister site uh, back 11 years ago. Uh, we became internet friends, and he started blogging with me on the, the main blog. And he would oh, he was profoundly interested in, in spiritual topics, and he wrote some of the the 
a couple very enduring essays uh, on the blog. He he hasn't he doesn't really have time for blogging with me anymore. Yes. <laughs> um, so this is kind of a thank you to him for his years of contribution uh, to the blog and also for um, his work helping me set up the, the website. So I included a couple of his essays here as well. But we always used to talk on the phone and have these long spiritual conversations. And, and a lot of his spirituality has very much affected mine. And um, go ahead. Well, I, I was going to say his, his essays, I thought uh, they, they fit seamlessly into this book. It was like as if there was one author, you know, it was, they were really good. And I'll, I'll get to some of his material later. Um, no, that's, that's great. Um, okay. Well, the, the first thing I kind of want to get into some of the, some of the chapters, I, we can't, I don't think we can get into all of it because there's a lot in it. Yeah. There's um, 40 chapters. Right. And, and, <laughs> uh, yeah, I, in preparing for this, I, highlighted the whole book practically <laughs> his book is full of sticky notes guys yes yes uh, sticky notes. um it was uh it was great to to kind of dig into this even more um mm -hmm. apart from publishing it um but i'm just going to start with the you know a couple of questions uh and maybe you can just kind of expound upon it um yeah. so from chapter one so chapter one is called uh let's see balancing truth and humility yeah you talk about the connection between certitude and arrogance mm. which is an i thought pretty interesting if i have certitude of the faith um could that lead to arrogance what's the difference between the two yeah well you know there's a sense in which you if you possess the truth about something if you're not careful, you can become uh, arrogant about the fact that you possess it. Like you can start to feel uh, feel special that you have access to this, or you can be dismissive about people who don't. You know, mm. you can you can have a sort of like the fact that you're so certain um, gives you a sort of um, yeah a sort of haughtiness. Sure. You know, and anyone who's ever talked to anyone online about religion at all. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, this is true, yeah. right? People can get overbearing and haughty and, and arrogant. So I started questioning, uh, how can you grow in certitude of faith or in the certainty of your faith without taking that on, you know, with, with without becoming, like, how can you be humble about what you know, but also be absolutely confident that sure. you know it, <laughs> right? you know? Right. So that's what, that's what led me to, uh, to address this, because I think it's important, especially if, uh, if we're talking to you know folks who don't don't agree with us, you know, and I, I gave several options, several suggestions in you, the book. You did, which, yes. Yeah, and w one of the big ones was to like resist viewing the faith in sectarian terms. That actually, that's what I highlighted, and I was going to actually read some of it, but I'd, I'd rather the no, oh, okay. no, no, I'd rather the author read his. <laughs> Do you want me to read it? Sure, sure, okay, absolutely. So I said. Um, it's easy to treat the faith, especially traditional Catholicism, as a sort of socio-political movement, viewing it through a lens that is almost sectarian. Traditional Catholicism has its own media outlets, its own talking heads, its own talking points, its own publications, partisans, and its own agenda. Not that it is wrong to have these things by any means, but it does mean we must always be on guard against treating the faith the way we would treat our own moribund secular politics. The faith certainly has socio-political ramifications, but it is not at its heart a socio-political movement, and refusing to treat it as such helps dissipate some of the hostility that comes with sectarianism. Oof, that's that's uh, I think that's very challenging. I have to admit. Um, I know that when I found the faith, I think early on, I admittedly I probably saw the the faith maybe in uh, i don't know in in uh, rather sectarian terms i would say but i think i think you're right we the, the faith is not sectarian it's it's um well it's the truth it's the truth and uh we need to bring people to the truth but we can't um yeah view it in these terms i think it's not a it's not a political struggle and yeah. so we don't need to have the the energy of uh you know of a of a mass media like talking head sure when we're i mean the, the faith is a it is a way right yeah and we think about where we came i did i wasn't born into the like i wasn't born into the faith 
and even if I was like, it's not like I was born with all the knowledge and sure. ex- you know, like we all have to like get to, we climb, you know, mm-hmm. we climb like a ladder. And uh, if someone's not at the same point on the ladder that we're at, like, like by what right do, are we arrogant with them? You right. know, like I used to be at a different spot on the ladder. That's just how God draws us through different ways. So um, I think just because we might feel or believe or know that we are at a different spot or higher up or have access to some truth that someone else doesn't know, there's no grounds for being haughty about it. And and we have to remember too, and I, I put this in the book too, faith is a gift, right? That's, that's right. Uh, it's yeah. not ours. We, we like to feel like it's something we discovered um, that we sought for, that we built, you know? Um, but we have to remember it's a gift in, in multiple ways, you know, yeah. that divine revelation didn't have to be made. God chose to give it to us. Uh, it was delivered to us by our forefathers, by the church, you know, uh, and that uh, in a theological sense, the gift of faith is something that's infused in us right. that we don't earn, you know. We can nurture the faith that we have, but, you know, we need to really remember that faith is a gift and to be thankful for what we have and you're right, and also that it's 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 a treasure, and we don't want to lose it. It's right. easy to lose, mm-hmm. and and I think it, later on in the book you talk about um, the loss of faith and kind of the uh, what happens when someone loses the faith, and it yeah. just to me it just points back to the fact that the faith is a gift, and we have to treasure it, we have to guard it, and not be as you said haughty about it and humble about it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I you you open the book with a, with a, quite a. If we really believe what Saint Paul says, where he says Christ came into this world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. Mm. If we have that ethos about yeah. how we came to faith and our own salvation, like we really have to have the disposition of, you know, I'm just a I'm just a beggar trying to show you where I can find some food. You know, that's really the proper disposition. I think. I, I agree. I agree. Um, um, I'm gonna kind of go on to the to chapter five. Uh, yeah. Not that the other chapters aren't good, but um, chapter five really struck out to me as quite an interesting um, chapter. So it's called the Greatest Schism. Oh yeah. Now you, you hear the word schism. Um, you hear it a lot these days. But it's not what you think. <laughs> this is a, a, a different type of uh, rupture, if you will, um, and. And I'll just kind of read what I what I had here in preparation. You speak of the fracture between theology and ascesis. Um, I don't know if I, I think I'm pronouncing that correctly. And spirituality and mortification. Hmm. Could you explain this division that you see, which you says uh, kind of gets to the heart of really all of our problems, and even I think you mentioned the modernist crisis. Yeah. So the um... In our heritage, the great spiritual writers and theologians uh, were also ascetics mm. um, to varying degrees. Not all of them were St. Anthony, you know, sleeping on a rock in a cave, <laughs> but they all practiced asceticism. Uh, St. Benedict, who gave us the most enduring monastic rule in the West, he lived in a cave for three years and always lived a rigorous, even when he was in the monasteries, lived a rigorous life. Um, uh, the fastings and the vigils that St. Teresa of Avila underwent, um, John of the Cross, even even St. Thomas Aquinas, he was extremely austere in his personal life. He went about barefoot. He he lived in, uh, you know, his, his cell was probably pretty drab and clammy, um, something that we would probably not, um, you know, tolerate. <laughs> sure. Um, you think of uh, St. Francis of Assisi, but not just the great um, spiritual leaders, but like even the the, the theologians. Um, we forget that St. Augustine um, of Hippo, he he's also known for formulating the, uh, the, the a rule. Uh, there, there's a, the Augustine canons that were later formulated based on a rule that came from, he had basically a monastery in his Episcopal residence where he was living a monastic existence. So uh, the point being that in the past, our great theologians and our spiritual leaders were living lives of mortification. And nowadays you get to a place where it's like, 
I can just I can just become a theologian. Just I, I just take these master's classes. Sure. Yeah. I maybe go online. I, I do this diocesan training program, uh, and I take these night classes, and I can become a spiritual director. You know, but but there's no. I mean, I'm not I'm not judging what people are doing in their private life. So I'm I'm just making that clear. I don't know what people are doing in their houses. You know. Right. But I'm saying that culture has disappeared from the church, where we're expecting our theologians and our spiritual leaders to be living lives of mortification. But in fact, it is that that uh, ascetical existence that helps detach one from worldly ways of thinking and living to give you those spiritual insights. I, I highlighted this. This is That's profound what you said. You said, in the past, we had theology and spirituality that proceeded from a life of faith, lived out in mm -hmm. all its rigor, Today, it is largely, the, as, as you just said, the, it is largely the domain of experts mm -hmm. whose approach is extremely anthropocentric because it is book learned yeah. based on the latest theories and the product of unaided human reason. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Um, yeah. It's like a, it's like the, um, and we see this all over our society with like the, the culture of experts and mm. it, it, administration and bureaucracy. And it's kind of like the spilling out of that into theology and, and spiritual life. Sure. Yeah. Wow. So that's what I call the the, gra the greatest schism in the book is the, the schism between our theology and our reason and then living uh, an ascetical existence in whatever way is, you know, appropriate for our state in life. Sure. Okay. That's, um, thank you. Thank you for your words um, there. Um I have I highlighted the next chapter and it's it's probably re it's related as you even say in the beginning. Yeah, they kind of go together. Yeah. Um, so we often hear about mortification, penance in terms of the Christian life. Why is mortification? Why is penance even necessary? Shouldn't all, all we need to do is just love, right? Love Christ. Uh, that shouldn't isn't that the only thing we need to do? <laughs> Well, why, why do we need to, you know, mortify ourselves? Yeah, well, I mean, St. Paul says we're supposed to. Yeah. <laughs> like he, yeah. says, he, he, says, um, he says, I chastise my body and bring it into subjection, lest perhaps when I have preached to others, I myself should become a castaway. And then he encourages everyone else to do the same thing. If you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you mortify the deeds of the flesh, you shall live. And then again in Colossians, mortify your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanliness, lust, evil, concupiscence, etc. So first off, mortification is simply obligatory for every Christian. It's, it's simply commanded in the New Testament. But why is it commanded? Because mortification simply means to put to death. And uh, in case you haven't this is going to be a big news flash. The spiritual life is hard, right? <laughs> uh, persevering is hard. Um, we have a, you know, we have concupiscence. We have a disposition towards selfishness. And uh, it's in the struggle against that that we develop virtue, right? And that entails putting to death our, our baser impulses. And like St. Paul says, capturing, taking even every thought captive and bringing it into alignment with the will of Christ. So mortification, putting things to death, is a way of, as I see it, uh, reordering the internal balance where, like, if you're not mortified, it's like you're just being passive to your desires, right? And to servicing your gratifications. Uh, and your, re your reason is just kind of following along, justifying yourself. Then when you mortify, it's kind of like a way of saying, like, no, my, my reason is on top. <laughs> like... Uh, yes, my body might be saying this, but I'm in charge here. I I'm, control the ship. It, do, you, do you think it's true uh, that even lawful desire, we should mortify even lawful desires, right? I mean, is, is that part yeah, of it? Yeah, I think so. We um, know about sin. We, we have to avoid sin, you know, sinful pleasures. But even lawful desires seems to be something that, I mean, at least I've, I've read and, and, and kind of understood. Right. That but, would even help us. Yeah, it, it would. It's kind of... It's kind of like to use a comparison to athletics, which St. Paul frequently uses uh, that comparison with the spiritual life as a kind of uh, race or, game, or uh, envisioning some sort of Greek Olympic competition, you know. Um, 
it's a difference between saying I'm just gonna avoid the junk food, you know, which we should be doing anyways, right. versus I'm gonna take positive steps to, uh, to, to exercise, to do these other things to make my life healthier, you know? And so even things that aren't bad, we should, we should mortify uh, for the sake of building up our spiritual vitality, you know? And th those acts of detachment help us to order ourselves towards God more fully. And I think that's the, the fundamental message you get through all Christian literature about the act of mortification, detachment, because, and I, I won't rant about this too long, but I think we talk about this elsewhere, holiness, like the, the etymology of the word holy means to be set apart, right? So you think of like holy water, this is water that's set apart for a use that's not secular, you know, or holy oil, holy people are people who are set apart, right? Um, and so obviously the more we can set apart our lives for God, that's what holiness is. And part of the way we do that is by divesting ourselves of attachments to even things that are lawful, yes. not because they're bad, right, right, but just because it helps us to be set apart. Yes. Um, now this is, I, I mean, this is, uh, maybe, um, a bit of a tangent, but do you think in the modern church, not... Uh, per se what the church offers, but do you think in the modern church there's a mentality that, you know, people don't need to mortify themselves? What, what do I mean by that? There seems to be uh, less of an emphasis on, on fasting, yeah. mortification. Yeah, um, well, in one, in one, that, yeah, I do agree with you. And in one sense, it's because, one, they're afraid of looking too negative or dour. Sure. Like they want the faith to be like happy. You know, and I agree Catholics should be happy. Yeah. We've talked about this many times. Yeah. But they're afraid of looking too miserable, like sure. that we're just like, oh, to be Catholic, you need to flog yourself half to death and starve <laughs> yourself. And yeah. you know, so they don't want to look like that. Number two, they're afraid because people are very imbalanced these days. So they're afraid that if you tell someone to, like I heard of a pastor who preached on fasting a couple times and then like multiple parishioners were like, my family developed eating disorders because of your homily, you know, telling us to fast, you know, telling the fast. And now my daughters have eating disorders and they're like blaming the pastor because he mentioned wow. fasting. So people are very unbalanced. And I think there's a fear of, uh, of that. And also I think there's been, and this is something that uh, Dom Noah and I have talked about many times, is there's kind of like a, uh, a bastardization of St. Teresa's little way that is very popular where uh, the little way, of course, is one of the most popular uh, spiritual principles today. And it's a, I've read, I love Story of a Soul. It's one of my favorite spiritual books. Uh, but there's kind of like a perversion of what Teresa's little way is because her little way is that in order to be holy, you don't need to do extraordinary things. You just need to do ordinary things with extraordinary love. Yes. And that's a beautiful principle. Sure. And that's really at the heart of a lot of this book. Yeah. But it's kind of been bastardized to where instead of saying you only need to do little things or ordinary things with extraordinary love, it's just, just do ordinary things and that's good enough. Um, where it's kind of like this idea of like, um, I I instead of like any s concept of strife, or overcoming, it's just like, hey, the little things that you do, like they already make you holy. Like you don't really need to wrestle, you know, I like, yeah. like realize that you doing the dishes, uh, that is make that is holiness. Now, this is a nuance here and people might complain if they don't understand it. Obviously doing the dishes can be an occasion of holiness. Uh, and St. Therese even uses that example in Story of a Soul about her doing dishes. But the thing is, she's doing the dishes with extraordinary love. That is, she's investing that simple act with an extreme amount of love, ordering it towards God, using the little inconveniences to offer them up for the salvation of her sisters, for atonement for her own sins, right? Now, that's what makes it so valuable. St. Therese did not say, just do the dishes and that that's what makes you holy, you know? <laughs> right. So there's this sense where people want to be just affirmed wherever they're at. They want to be like, hey, Mrs. Housewife, like what you're doing, like that's just good. That's good enough, you know, uh, or, or Mr. Whatever you're doing, you're fine, you know? Um, and so I think there is a reluctance to preach mortification because mortification implies that we're not fine where we're at, that we need to make effort. Now, obviously the point of the, the point of Therese's little way is we don't all have to go to a mountain. We don't have to, 
you know, sleep with our head on a rock or, you know, fast for 40 days. Uh, but we do have to take the things we're doing and make a conscious effort to orient them towards God and towards detachment and for purposes of mortification. And if you're not doing that, that's not the little way. That, that's, it reminds me of something, and you, this, is, this is a famous saying from Archbishop Sheen. Um, he said, you, you don't need to wear a hair shirt, your neighbor is a hair shirt. So yeah. I, I think that's a similar kind of principle. But, um, but yeah, it, it's very, very interesting. Um, so we all need to be mortified. <laughs> yeah, but if your neighbor is a hair shirt, then, well, then how, do you, how do you turn that towards holiness? Sure. Like, do you just yes. be like, that, oh, my neighbor's a hair shirt, I'm suffering, therefore it. I'm making spiritual progress that's because it. I'm annoyed. <laughs> you know, like, um, you know, yeah. like you have to consciously wrestle with that and, that and be like, I'm orienting this towards God and you have to make it into a prayer. Right. You know, um, I, I'm going to stay on this chapter yeah, just yeah. for one one more uh, kind of a bit. Um, there's something that you wrote where I kind of related it to my own life. I mean, I'm, I don't want to get too personal, but... Um, you said it's towards the very end. It mm -hmm. said simply growing up in a broken home or living in poverty or enduring a tragedy of some kind or some kind of abuse does not mean the suffering has been meritorious. It can be if it is handled rightly, but the mere fact of suffering is not meritorious. Um, you go on and even if these things have been suffered, the call to mortification is constant. We can never say, I have denied myself enough in the past. I need not do it anymore. I, I, I found that very, uh, very poignant. Um, yeah, that goes back to this point we were just talking about where when you do endure some kind of suffering, whether it's being imposed from without or whatever sure. you volunt like, like the, the growth is in how you deal with it, right? In what you do with that suffering. Because we all know, you know, we all know some person in our life who has lots of suffering or they've had a bad, but like, it doesn't help them because all they do is gripe about it. All they do, it makes them bitter, right? All they do is like, oh, I'm, what a victim I am. And, and it doesn't help them because they haven't handled it rightly. So the mere fact that, that we have crosses, it's all in the response prompted by grace and the more we respond rightly the more grace we receive and god will always give us grace to overcome any difficulty i, I know I've, i found that in in my own life whatever difficulties i've had um you know grace his is, grace is sufficient that's it yeah. that's it um uh thank you uh i'm gonna go on to the next chapter i mean um at this rate we're gonna go through every chapter but don't don't worry <laughs> Um, the next chapter is God loves you. Oh yes, very, very true. Yeah. Um, I, I, when I read this this chapter, I, I just thought it offered us a lot of um, hope amidst you know all the scandals in the world, and there are a lot of scandals. Yeah. Um, and I'm just gonna just kind of highlight one the section towards the end on page 36. Uh, if if you're following. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, Yes, there will be scandal. Yes, there will be embarrassment due to human error, arrogance, and sin. But ultimately, it is irrelevant to your own faith. Did Jesus rise or didn't he? He rose in power. That is what this day commemorates, I'm speaking of Easter. Yeah. Um, and if you hold close to him, you have power too. Power to remake the world according to God's law starting with yourself. Mm. Uh, so it's a very personal thing. Then the church, then the world. It, and this is what I highlighted um, exactly. It doesn't matter what they do. You know, you hear all the scandals uh, yeah. amongst hierarchy, etc. Yeah. Um, you keep doing what you know you need to do. If the church needs holiness, you be holy. If the world needs compassion, you you be compassionate. If you do not see Christians devoted to prayer, you be devoted to prayer. Mm. The kingdom is within you and it starts with you. Heaven begins in your heart today. Mm. I mean, you know, hopefully a reader that reads this and is struggling 
will come away with a lot of um, hope in that. Um, yeah, yeah, and it's it, it's not meant to be a kind of pie in the sky denial sure. that there's scandal right. or that we don't care about right. scandal, but from the point of view of okay, so I've read about this scandal. What do I do? Right? How am I? How do I react? Well, in a certain sense the scandal doesn't change how you react. <laughs> like, yeah. you keep doing what, you know, it, it's kind of like, I know what my master told me to do. And you keep doing what the master told you to do. And you focus on that. That's and a right. lot of times we think, and I do get flack for this online when I express this view because people don't like it. But, you know, I've often said uh, that these things aren't our concern, ultimately. Um, uh, for example, we can get all worked up and think like, if if the church was in a better state, then I would be able to live my my calling better. Or if the country was this way, then I would do that. And I, I feel like that view is profoundly backwards. Like, we, the, the church becomes better by us becoming better first. Um, and that's the way it's always been. So I've, all t I've always argued that, like, I don't start with the, the premise of I need to, like, crusade for the church to be fixed. I mean, I, I do. I want that, you know. Right. But like from a point of view, again, of what do I do in my spiritual life, you focus on what Jesus said you need to be doing. Like, you know that you need to pray. You need to be compassionate. You need to be loving. You need the fruits of the Spirit. You need to be holy. You need sanctity. Those are the things that are your focus or that they should be, right? And then there's a way that just that just holiness radiates out from that, you know? And one of the great things I've loved about reading church history is the way that you always get this man or woman who is like, I just want to go live alone somewhere and uh, just love God. Yeah. And then they end up like the head of an order of like 10,000 right. <laughs> people and they like reform half the the continent. That's you know? right. Like, like think of St. Francis Assisi walking out of his town naked, you know, or, or uh, clothed with, you know, whatever rags. And he just wants to go do his thing and he ends up like reforming the church's spiritual life or yes. saint benedict or saint anthony mm -hmm. you know these are people who understood their priorities you know or saint Teresa of avila they focus on them on their own spiritual life and becoming uh, they know that the most important thing is that christ is made manifest in in their life i also like to 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 think that okay god put us in this situation here and now for a reason, mm -hmm. we're, we're, we we weren't born in the Middle Ages. We're born here, twenty twenty, uh, you know, the twenty first century, yeah. you know, twentieth century. We were born in that era. Now we have to make the best of the situation we're in now. But we're given the graces. We still have the sacraments. Uh, we still have the saints, the example of the saints. We have so much, um, and. Uh, you know, in a, in a certain sense, it doesn't matter what's happening in the church as far as scandal. In a certain sense. Yes, in a certain sense. Yeah, exactly. I'm, I'm not one to advocate for uh, not caring or just Head saying... Head in the sand, yeah. Exactly, or everything's okay. That's, that's not what I'm saying. But um, I think you said it, priorities. What are our priorities? Yes, precisely. Um, what are our, I mean, I've spent a lot of time talking about problems in the church on my, my website and and articles, so it's not a thing to just ignore, sure. but it's it's a question of priority. Like, you know, we should put it this way. Do the scandals in the church determine the development of my spiritual life? Right. Or do they not? They should not. Whatever's going on in the church should not be determining the development of your spiritual life. That's right. Um, Jesus Christ does, the gospel does, you know, that's where we start. And then those other things, we pay attention to them, we work as best we can, but, you know, we don't let ourselves become, deter you know, determined by them. That, that's, that's absolutely true. Um, all right, I'm going to go to the, um, again, I can go through every chapter, but <laughs> uh, th this chapter, I, I, it was, it struck me as pretty, pretty profound because uh, I'm a convert, so mm. Uh, chapter 10, Hearts of Stone to Hearts of oh, Flesh. Oh, that's the one with convert stories? Yeah, I love them. I love yeah. them. And I'll tell you why, but um, yeah, they're, they're about people, the different ways people came to the faith, but, and they're not, I would say, the reasons uh, or the examples you gave are not people who came to the faith necessarily, primarily at least, through intellectual kind of, um, you know, arguments, study, yeah. study uh, 
although that's important, I think in every case there would be, you know, uh, you know, study and and such. But that wasn't the what brought them to the faith, and I found that really interesting. Um, yeah, they were converted by very uh, beauty or music or that 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 that's right. Um, and I I wrote down God still draws people to Himself. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, I just I'll, just I'll just relate something personally. I don't you know I don't not a lot of people know about my own story, but whatever. It's it's um, but I came to the faith. I would say primarily through beauty. Beauty and order, I would say. Yeah. Beauty insofar as I saw the, the church's liturgy, um, you know, the traditional liturgy. Right. Um, and also Gregorian chant. That struck me as so beautiful and profound that, um, you know, that led me to look into the claims of the church and such. But it was beauty that, that got me. It wasn't the Summa. I'm not saying the Summa is not important. But for me, um, and... Granted, I was relatively young, so I wouldn't have understood the Summa anyway. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it was beauty that, that brought me to the faith. And, yeah. um, and it's true. I think, you know, he, he, God draws people to the church through different means. And, and I would say, you know, beauty is definitely one of, one of the main, main things, main ways that he brings people yeah, to Yeah, there's a story in the chapter about a, uh, about a couple that were getting married and they were both kind of like non-practicing Catholics, and they were just looking for a venue for their wedding, and they just wanted a pretty church. Like, they didn't really consider themselves believers, and they are just driving through the country, and they come to this beautiful, historic, uh, like, neo-Gothic, you know, 1870s uh, church out in the country, and they kind of just walk in, you know, kind of blissfully naive, and they're like, we want to get married here because it's a pretty church. And the pastor, who was someone I knew, per he told me this story. He said that he greeted them and he just kind of started giving them a catechesis on what the church is, um, why the art is so beautiful, what the art represented. And uh, the couple were blown away. And by the end of that meeting, they signed up for RCIA. Wow. <laughs> and and they, they returned to the practice. Of the f and they were married in that church, wow. uh, but in a totally different mindset. So sure. they just walked in admiring the beauty and the pastor just gave them a catechesis on what that symbolism represented, and then that was enough to get them back. Wow. Wow. That's, um... <laughs> Isn't that cool? That's amazing. Yeah, um... that, that couple was in my... When I taught RCIA, they were in my in my class. Oh, they were? Yeah, I didn't put that in the book. Oh, you didn't? <laughs> this is how I heard the story. They, oh, my, wow. my pastor, uh, he, he was like, hey, you're going to get this couple in your class, and this is their story, and I was blown away by it. <laughs> wow. Um... Yeah, I'm just gonna. I'll sure, just go read ahead. a little bit of from from that section. Uh, well, actually, this is it's a the, different group. Different. Yeah, one, this yeah. is so it's page fifty four. The at the very end, you will note that in none of the above cases was the person converted by hearing a bunch of arguments. It was other things: beauty, liturgy, a sense of their own sinfulness, the glory of Catholic culture. To be sure, after their hearts were converted, argumentation and intellectual reasoning stepped in to solidify them in their faith. But in none of these cases did rational argumentation precipitate their conversion. Um, this is certainly not to say that nobody has ever argued into the faith. Many people are. But how God chooses to bring individuals into the church are as varied as people themselves. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was a great chapter. Um, I'm going to skip to, again, there's so much I could say uh, or we can talk about, but I'm going to skip to Dom Noah's um, uh, article, and he, it's called The Rosary in Poverty, which, mm. is, which is quite, quite a fascinating article. Yeah. Um, you know, the rosary, everybody knows about the rosary, but actually Leo the he, he he said that the rosary is a remedy um, for the evils afflicting society, which which I found was fascinating. Yeah. And um, I'm just going to read just a little section. He says, today, this is from Dom Noah. Yeah. Today, the politics of envy and greed abound. This development is not surprising. In fact, it was predicted by our Holy Father, Pope Leo XIII of Holy Memory. If I'm not mistaken, didn't he write something like over 10 encyclicals on the rosary, or at least he mentions the rosary yeah. in, in quite a few encyclicals. Yeah. Um, and he says, uh, let's see. Um, 
Pope Leo XIII on the next page had a remedy for these evils. And this, this is pretty hard hitting. <laughs> the remedy will not be satisfactory to those intellectuals who are not satisfied with anything unless it is comprehensive, nor will it be for those ac activists who mask their desire for vengeance with demands of justice and their moral vanity. Mm. Wow. Um, That's powerful. That is powerful. <laughs> the remedy is meditation on the joyful mysteries of the Holy Rosary. Um, yeah, that's, um, and actually uh, there's another section I wanted to read from him. And this, this really struck me from Dom Noah. Yeah, he said, ahead. if we tell the man with a dollar that his suffering is in vain and that he need not be patient in it, then surely he will not be. If we tell the rich man that poverty is to be avoided, he will probably make sure he has more than enough for himself and not be generous in almsgiving. Both lead to more consequences here and in, in eternity. So I think he's saying by meditating on the rosary, especially the joyful mysteries, we can have a maybe a, a greater appreciation for maybe the spirit of poverty and um, you know how that can actually help society. Yeah, he's he's arguing that the uh, that the that for those who are wealthy, they need to meditate on their. Uh, on their spiritual poverty, <laughs> right? Yeah. On, on, on detachment and uh, and for those who are have temporal poverty, they need to meditate on the spiritual riches that are made available through the faith. But he's saying that in our modern world, we often see the the opposite, where instead of trying to uh, I instead of preaching on uh, how riches can entangle us, mm -hmm. which I mean, the scripture says that the love of money is the root of all evil. Yes. Right? Um, instead of preaching that, we, you know, even though the Catholicism doesn't embrace a full prosperity gospel, no. you know, it's, it's some of it has bled, in to, uh, bled into that, where we, we are kind of afraid to, to preach on the, uh, the spiritual entanglements and dangers that come with wealth. Because we might, you know, we might irritate the wealthy parishioners that we need to donate to fix the parking lot or, that, or whatever, and then with and then with the poor, you know, we we almost have focused so much on on uh, the social justice aspect that like, well, it's a, you know, uh, it's an injustice that you're in this situation. We've almost forgotten to to teach them how to seek, how to seek God's consolation in their poverty. That's right. That's right. So, um, and that's why Leo the Thirteenth, writing in the midst oh, of like the uh, the the labor crisis. That's right, uh, Rerum Novarum, right? Yeah, so yeah. It, He's saying that this the spirituality that you see in the Rosary is a natural way to like spiritually bring harmony between these problems between the rich and the poor. Right. He's not saying that's comprehensive by any means because sure. we know he has a whole encyclical mm -hmm. on the. But he's saying from a spiritual perspective, we need to start with this sort of contemplation. Wow. Um, yeah, hopefully that'll, that'll help people who are actually praying the rosary to maybe, uh, meditate on, on some, some important truths. Yes. Um, all right. Uh, the next chapter I wanted to talk about is, is really an interesting one. Mm. I think you, you had a response to this. Yeah. It's Alcuin to Higbald, a Christian view on temporal misfortunes. Oh yeah. First of all, why should we... Why should we read someone from the Middle Ages um, talking about temporal misfortunes? Um, how how could that help us in well the 21st century? Well, I was re the so uh, so Higbald was the the abbot of a monastery. I want to say the monastery of Lindisfarne, maybe in in northern England, and Alcuin, of course, the famous monk from the court of Charlemagne. Um, and uh, Alcuin had heard that Higbald's monastery had been sacked by the Vikings <laughs> and all their stuff had been taken and many of the, the brothers had been killed. And so Alcuin wrote Higbald a letter to comfort his friend in the misfortune. And the nature of the letter is, uh, is very much not what we would expect. He says, do not be dismayed by this disaster. God chastises every son whom he accepts, so perhaps... He has chastised you more because he loves you more. And then he talks about how Higbald should use this opportunity to become holier, to uh, reflect on whether he's committed any sins he needs to repent of. 
Um, and he basically he basically tells him that hey, this is part of God's providence, and you need to use it for your holiness. Um, which I was astounded by because I, I wrote this because I was I was reading uh, some commentary by some Catholics online who were having an argument about um, reaction to to some disaster or some mm -hmm. misfortune, and it was very much along the lines of. Um, Oh, God wouldn't, God would never do, you know, kind of like you see like a flood or a natural disaster sure. or something. And people say, did God do that? And they're like, oh, no, 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 no. God, God didn't do that. God would, you know, and it's kind of like, is God in control or, or isn't he? Like he literally does natural disasters all through the scriptures and through Christian history. And I, I decided to look back and see like how a Christian a thousand years ago, when they had some misfortune, how they processed it. And that's why Alcuin's letter struck out to me so much because he was just kind of like, yeah, God did this. And if if it's suffering, you know, God chastens those whom he loves. There's a reason why this happened. God is good. We know that. And there must be some way that you can um, that you can turn this to your advantage. And so I encourage you to meditate on that. Um, he didn't pull any punches with him, no, you know. No. <laughs> and I think today, like if we were to take that, um, if if I were to go to the people who just had their homes burned in Maui it's, and be like, yeah, I, God, God did this. He wants you to learn something from it, or what? You know, it would be just like, how horrible are you for saying that? You right. know. And I'm not saying that uh, that Alcuin couldn't have been more. Uh, empathetic in the way he worded these things sure, sure. but then again these are monks you know they are right. they're professed monks whose purpose is to do this you know so i'm not saying we need to exactly imitate this um but i am saying that uh that alcuin has a very standard classical explanation for for evil that temporal misfortunes fall equally on everyone alike and the difference is not in what happens to us but in how we respond to it and that's what he's encouraging higbald to do is it's like you can't change that this happened. The best you can do is is uh, have a holy response to it. And that's what God wants, ultimately. I, I think that's uh, a healthier in, in a healthier attitude than just saying evil exists. Therefore, you know, th there can't be a good God. You know, it, that kind of that kind of um, kind of argumentation you often hear. I, and, and that doesn't seem Obviously, it's a philosophical. There are a lot of. There's a philosophical thing, a theological, but it, that seems too simplistic. It is too simplistic. But even beyond that, you hear people will try to kind of like section off parts of our temporal existence from God's causation. Like they will, mm. they will attribute, like if any good thing happens, oh, praise the Lord, bless the Lord, this happened. But then the tornado wipes out your town. And people are like, did God do that? Or why did I God see. do that? And, and you'll even on Catholic radio, like, no, like, oh, God's not responsible for this or God, you know, I see. whatever, where it's kind of like they want to cordon off disastrous things and say God wasn't involved in that. That was just a, a fluke or that was just, and it's kind of like, does God operate through the secondary causes of nature or, or doesn't he? Now, I don't want to say like, yes, God, like, oh yeah, the reason the tornado destroyed your home is because God is punishing you for your wickedness. I would never say that because right, right. <laughs> Jesus says specifically that we, you know, that the, the, the disciples literally are talking about that. And Jesus says, uh, he, he used an example. He says, uh, you heard that story about those men that the tower of Siloam fell and crushed them in the gospel. He says this, he says, do you think they were worse sinners than anyone else? Mm. Um, because there was a tendency to think like, oh, if something bad happened, they must be getting punished for a specific sin, which is also in the, the heart of the book of Job as well. And Jesus says, no, that's not what, what's going on here. But he says, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. That's like his, his takeaway. Don't try to reflect on and, and figure out like, did this happen because those guys, like, did the tower fall on them because they were sinners? He says, no, you focus on yourself. Unless you repent of your sins, you're not going to be any better off than them. And that's what Alcuin yeah. tells, tells Higbald. Uh, maybe you didn't get killed by the Vikings. You're still alive, and so you can still work on your spiritual life, and so do it. And that's, yeah. his, that's his takeaway. And if that seems harsh to us, um, it's because it encapsulates a whole worldview that we've kind of left behind, which is seeing God's providence through all the secondary things, the, all the secondary causes in our lives, not just the ones that we like, but even the ones we don't like. Wow. Um, 
Thank you. That's kind of deep. It, uh, yeah, I'm trying to process this still. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> the next chapter is, I think you received a response from a reader. Uh, it's called Waves of Darkness. Yeah. Um, and this, what I wrote is, uh, you give a great response to a reader who's having a difficult time with what is happening today in the church. Um, and I said, I think a lot of people can can uh, relate to what he said, you know. And, yeah. But I think your response can help. Yeah, um, so what this guy said was he, he read the article on Higbald and Elquin, and he said that works for, like, natural disasters. Sure. But not when, like, human beings are... He, he's looking at the world, and he's, he's saying... Uh, We've got a corrupt financial system, scandal-ridden church, like republics on the verge of collapse, yeah. Western civilization is falling, there's, yeah. you know, wh whatever. A everybody is evil. And he said, so how can I, you know, how can I deal with this? He mentioned politics, media, war, education, music, entertainment, healthcare, law. Like, he brought up every, every, everything. everything. Yeah. It's like everything is screwed, <laughs> you know. Um and so what I said, here's what, I'll just read it. I said, when I read this comment, my response is, friend, who told you to worry about such things? <laughs> when were these problems entrusted to your care? What did our Lord say? He said, do not worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. So, and then I said, I'm convinced this passage from the Beatitudes is instrumental in staving off despair. Mm. Now, the commenter is right. Power, influence, money, media, institutions are all under the power of darkness right now. Um, but is that really new? Uh, the devil said to Jesus, All this power I will give unto thee and the glory of them, for it is delivered unto me and whomsoever I will give it. The devil is saying 2,000 years ago that he had control over it then yeah. too. <laughs> I don't know if that's accurate, if the devil was lying or telling the truth, but it's interesting. But the fact is, none of that's my business. My response to this evil must be the same as Christ's. Worship the Lord thy God, and him alone shall you serve. None of these other issues are my problem. And honestly, I'm not empowered to fix them. Like, I, I can't, like, what am I going to do? Like, reform Hollywood? Like, So you know what people do? I, <laughs> well, I, I find it that they want to put the whole weight of the world on their shoulders. They do. And... That is a burden that is not theirs. It's well, it's nobody's burden, um, and and they, no one can continue to live the Christian life with that type of burden on their shoulders. They're gonna break. They are. And you see it so often, people you know losing the faith again. There's a there's a chapter it's you talk it's, about that. It, it's because it's, it's easier to, it's easier to take. It's a big burden. But in another way, it's easier to take on that burden than it is to be nice to your mother-in-law sure. or something like that. You know, sure. that's right. <laughs> you know, that's right. It, um, it makes you feel like it makes you feel like you are crusading, that you are a martyr, because you're you're yeah. suffering this. Um, but like our Lord never told us to take all that on. What our Lord said specifically, it like here's some quotes. First uh, Thessalonians 4.11, aspire to live quietly and mind your own affairs. That's right from the New Testament. Pray that we may lead quiet and peaceable lives, 1 Timothy 2.2, 2, right? Um, uh, sufficient for the day is its own trouble, <laughs> right? Christ really only asks us to be faithful with what we have been entrusted, with the little bits that's, that's right. been given to you. So what's been given to you? You've got uh, You've got a family. Mm -hmm. You've got a job, you've got a a, a little uh, business, Catholic publishing business that mm -hmm. you run. There it is. That's, That's your right. world. That's what goes on your shoulders. That's right. Right? Not like what the Vatican is doing, what the Canadian government is doing. Obviously, you can care about these things and have opinions. But like in term, we're speaking of the burden that you take on mentally, spiritually, right? Um those aren't your burdens. That's right. That's right. Um, you know, um, commit it to the Lord. Pray, pray about it. Give it to, give it to God. That's right. Um, I, when you said, I'm just going to read. Um, it's also on the in the same chapter. You said, I have a deeper peace and more profound sense of God's mercy than I have in years past. That's just my experience. I understand that for someone who is in crisis, that will certainly not be their experience. 
but don't tell me my religion is broken because you are in crisis. My faith is not in crisis and nothing is broken for me. Yes. Um, wow. mm. I mean, yeah. So there's people that will say like uh, Catholicism is broken because, and then they list their problems. And it's kind of like, we were talking about this at breakfast, like people have a tendency to universalize their own experience. Yes. Like it's broken for me and therefore it is broken, you know? That's right. And it's kind of like, you know what? Don't, don't speak for me, you know? Just because you're having problems doesn't mean I am having problems. That's right. And it's okay for me to not have problems. It doesn't mean that I'm ignoring the issues, mm -hmm. you know? But don't come out here and be like, uh, all these things are happening. I suffered through this crisis. And therefore, there's this huge uh, existential problem with the faith that I need to bring to everybody's attention and expect everybody to uh, agree. Uh, because just because you stumbled, you know, doesn't mean I have to stumble or that I'm wrong for not stumbling. Right. You know? Right. Um, yeah. We have to keep going. Keep yeah. going. Um this is kind of a related related chapter. I'm, I'm jumping ahead to chapter 23, okay. uh, Escaping Our Subjectivity. Mm, yeah. And in it, you describe the patterns of a loss of faith. Um, I, I found this, this absolutely fascinating. Um, why? Because I, I've known people who have, you know, lost the faith. Um, and... You, you kind of wonder why. why? How does someone lose the faith? Yeah. Um, Did you want me to review that? That, that process? Yes, yes. Um, I, I just highlighted one, one section. It said the church, for the person who loses the faith, the church as an object of affection is no longer desirable. Oh, yeah. So this chapter is about how, like, you will often see people who are in the process of losing their faith yes. online, and maybe they're, like, talking about their struggles. And then you have people whose faith is intact, and they talk past each other oh, right. because they yeah. don't recognize what the other is dealing with. Right. So, like, a person who is losing their faith, uh, they might be talking about why they're losing their faith, and the person whose faith is intact will be giving intellectual arguments for why they shouldn't abandon the faith. But the thing is, uh, when people are losing faith, the reason they lose it is because the church is no longer an object of affection. It's, they, they don't feel like it's something that draws their love. So um, the way we gain faith, you know, we, we start typically with belief. You know, this is the process by which we grow faith. We grow in, in faith as we believe. And then because we believe, we nurture our faith it yields hope. Hope is like a, a chain that anchors us to our eternal destiny. It like forms a tangible connection between now and eternity and helps and strengthens us on the way. And then once we have that hope, once we're plugged in, it, it, it brings forth charity and love and it helps us to see the church, to see God as objects of affection, mm -hmm. right? Um, and it, st it starts faith, hope, and love, right? But then when people lose faith, they lose it in reverse order. Like they lose love first. So the first thing that happens is the, the church or whatever ceases being worthy of, of uh, affection in their mind. And so they don't love the church. Maybe they've griped at it too long. Maybe the church has done too many things, pushed them over the edge, and they can no longer affirm that the church is worthy of love. They only see its defects. Once they see that, then it's not surprising that their hope withers, like the, the umbilical cord that connects you to the supernatural reality withers. And then if you no longer have love and you're no longer con connected, the faith, the, the, the intellectual affirmation falls last, right? So what happens when people are losing faith is they're no longer seeing the, they're no longer seeing the church as something lovable. Right. That's right. But then people come to them and give them arguments intellectually on why they should believe. Right. But the problem is one of in the affections that their that their love is growing cold first. How, so how would you approach someone like that? I mean, what do you what do you do? I mean, in, in such a case. Oh, Not and then and, and then the other person, too, uh, I should say, because the other person's love has grown cold, they also fail to see the weight of the arguments. I see. Because, like, may, the arguments might be very weighty, you know? 
but if they don't love the object that the arguments are tending towards, it's kind of like I had, like, many listeners might have this experience where you had a teacher that you hated because they were mean or they were bad, and you also couldn't learn the subject because the teacher was so bad or because the teacher was mean or whatever. And then you get another teacher who is understanding, mm -hmm. and then you learn the subject. Because the fact is, if you, if you hate the teacher, it doesn't matter what they tell you because you're not going to be receptive to it. So if someone hates the institution, like already they hate the institution, it's, you, you can't, there's an obstacle there. You, you can give them all sorts of intellectual arguments, but until that obstacle is kind of uh, removed, then they won't even hear the arguments. Yeah. Is that kind of what you're saying? Exactly. So what I was saying in the, in the chapter is that when we are talking with people who are losing faith, we have to understand that and I'm talking about people who have not totally lost faith, but they're in the process. I see, yes. They're hanging on by a thread, you know. We have to understand that often it's an effective thing where it's it's about they're no longer seeing the church as something desirable. And we have to not um, not approach it incorrectly by trying to make intellectual arguments. But I also call for people in the chapter, if they are one of these people who are wavering with faith, to have the humility to understand that just because you're in a place of suffering— and you can't see the strength of the arguments doesn't mean that the arguments are false. It means maybe you're numb to them because you've heard them so many times. Maybe because you're in a state of crisis, you're not appreciating the logical force of them. Um, so again, it was it was kind of a call for people to stop talking past each other mm -hmm. and to kind of understand where the other person is coming from and to uh, to address those issues instead of just a kind of firing the same old uh, cannonades <laughs> against sure. each other. And oftentimes, it's people who are actually, they're in very bright who lose the faith or are in the process of losing the faith. So it's not, it's not as if they're not, they can't appreciate arguments, but for some reason, they're, they're losing, they're not seeing the church as lovable anymore. It's, it's very interesting. Yeah, to and me. you'll find people, I think we've all seen folks like this online. We might even be able to think of some ourselves, but we're not going to name names. But um, you get these people who were Catholic once and they're, they were brilliant, you know, and had extreme insight and nuance. And then they lose the faith and you see them down the road and they're making like they're making like high school level atheists. Sure. Uh, like they're kind of like, really? Like they're making like high school level atheist criticisms that are just like ridiculous. And it's like, how uh, like how did you how did you fall to that level? Like you would have. You know, 10 years ago, you would have, like, seen how ridiculous that is. But it's because they no longer see the church as something lovable, and ergo, the church's arguments don't penetrate. Um, Carol Robinson, you know, whom mm -hmm. I, I love very much, um, you know, I'm, yeah. and we're publishing all of her works. She relates in one of her um, essays, which, which is going to be published soon, um, in, in a book, uh, about a, a certain priest from from the UK. I won't name the priest. He's no longer a priest and no longer a Catholic, but he was he was brilliant. He's still alive. Right. And he's now considered like a, a great philosopher. Okay. But he was a priest, and at some point, and, and I'm wondering if this 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 uh, applies to him. He knew scholastic philosophy. He knew the faith inside and out, probably. Um, but at some point, he stopped believing, and he eventually became an agnostic. Yeah. So how does that happen? I mean, this is a priest, brilliant philosopher, but at some point, it, it would have to be. He no longer saw the church as, as lovable. Something. It's, it's, something you know, happened, right? I mean, yeah. so... Or sometimes people grapple with, you know, something they can't, they can't get. People, th this would be a good segue into, uh, into talking about th this, but... Um, People often grapple with a, um, if they can't resolve something, uh, they have a problem they can't resolve and they, they aren't comfortable with the idea of holding mm. propositions that they can't resolve. So they might be like, well, let's say I'm, I'm struggling with, uh, you know, same sex attraction or whatever, mm -hmm. but the church and moral law teaches this. And so they have a hard time resolving those two. So rather than rather than saying something like yes i i have this and i experience it but i also know it's you know objectively disordered 
they have to have one side triumph entirely. That's, you know, where it's like, yes. okay, either I'm going to full-blown reject the church's teaching and embrace this, or I have to uh, kind of try to try to completely repress it and, and deny that it's that I even have it. And then you can get, and I, I know many, you know, I, I know people who, who get who, who get married and then and then later it's like the 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 man was gay and he was just like kind of like in denial that he was wow. homosexual and he thought that like getting married to a woman would, would like would, um, paper it over it. cure yeah, it or yeah. whatever you know and then it caused all sorts of problems so but the the fact is like you often have people that can't deal with a tension that they can't resolve and they have to push it over one side or the other wow wow it's um i, f I found those chapters well, actually, the the next chapter is going to be somewhat related as well, um, but yeah, that's it's fascinating. I, I think in in modern life also kind of precipitates a lot of these tensions and these these struggles. Um, but you know, I I think people have always struggled, and, right? But um, I think it's more so now. You know, we're very much. Um, you know, we're, we're not in a Christian society anymore. No, so. of course not. There's all sorts of struggles we never thought we'd have to deal with. But again, you know, God gives gives us grace. Mm -hmm. That's um, the the next chapter I wanted to mention um, is chapter twenty nine, the dark mirror of faith. Yeah, that that was quite fascinating. Um, the first thing I wanted to to just point out um, is. Because you talk about the certitude of faith. What, what, what do you mean by the certitude of faith? How does the faith give us certitude? Um, wait, are you talking about this chapter? Uh, yes, chapter 29. Um, you say, let's see. Uh, okay, well, okay, so in this chapter, I'm, okay, so I'm not talking about the certitude of faith in the sense of the propositions of faith. Sure, okay. I'm talking about having, I'm talking about when you're trying to resolve something in your own life, right? So I come across a lot of Catholics who are wrestling with things and they're trying to understand how to reconcile them, right? Uh, they, want, they want things to be, they want to settle an issue, mm. you know, and they feel like their spiritual life is on hold until they can settle it, like until they can get some certain conclusion, right? Um, and what I talk about in this chapter is that faith, like, okay, you, so I'll just say it right here. It says... Uh, you do not need to resolve your difficulties in order to maintain faith. That's on page 148. Uh, you, you don't need to mm. resolve your difficulties. Um, so oftentimes we get these problems in our life. Uh, maybe they're doubts. You know, maybe they're, they're things that we're questioning. Maybe they're personal struggles. Uh, and we often feel like we want to resolve them. And we feel like our spiritual lives are on hold or our faith is being damaged until we can find some answer to these problems. And what I'm arguing here is that faith by its very nature is imperfect. Um, it is provisional. That is, faith passes away once we get to heaven, right? It's, uh, <clears throat> it's imperfect. St. Paul compares it to looking in a dark mirror where you see the outlines of things but you don't see perfectly. Uh, remember, the symbol of faith from the Old Testament is Jacob wrestling with the angel. So there is a there is what I call in the chapter a not yetness about faith, where there's like a sense in which uh, there there's going to be a sense of imperfection. Um, not again, not not in the uh, not in like the propositions of faith, mm -hmm. but in um, in our experience of faith, right? Um, even St. Paul said for him it was like seeing in a mirror dimly. And what I wrote in the book is there's going to be a sense of imperfection, a deep yearning, a wrestling, a sense of not yetness, a wandering about in the murky dusk of existence, struggling to come into the brilliance of daylight. Like, we're all looking for that. We're all looking That's for right. that, you know, um, that Mount Tabor moment when Jesus is illumined and we see yeah. the whole reason for everything. But the fact is, like, that's never made a condition for us having faith or persevering. We're supposed to wrestle with things. Like that's part of faith is you're supposed to not understand things. Uh, you're supposed to struggle. You're supposed to try to figure out how things balance. And most importantly, you're supposed to be able to go on even if you don't get the answers. Like you're, uh, you know, I knew a woman who, uh, whose, whose son had a, um, 
uh, had like a, uh, a cognitive brain degeneration where he was slowly losing mental function, you know, over the years. Mm -hmm. And she was really struggling to come up with a reason for why it was happening. You know, like she would say, well, maybe God wanted me to learn this or that, or maybe it's happening, or, or maybe, you know, this happened and I met Dr. So-and-so and that was going to bring me into contact with this person. And she kind of had to have the flow chart mapped out in her head of why yeah. this had happened, you know, and that's very understandable. And I, you know, I empathize with her desire to do that. But what I'm saying is like, we don't have to have that picture. In fact, usually we don't. Um, we are meant to simply wrestle with things. We are meant to grapple with things and just and just go forward. So in other words, we don't need to have a matter settled. Right. You know, and we could talk about this with relation to uh, the crisis in the church and the, sure. the papacy and what's going on in Rome. Like, I don't have to figure out exactly what I believe about uh, under what circumstances could the Pope lose his office? Sure. Like, I don't have to, ha I don't have to have an answer. And you, you see know? that people are talking about that and wrestling with it, which is, it's I, good. It could, yeah, yeah it, you can wrestle with it, but, but you but don't, they're getting obsessed about it. As yeah. If they need to settle the question. Right. As if their faith can't go on until they settle the question. That That's right. Yeah. And, you, and, and I'm arguing here, you don't need to settle the question. Like, <laughs> well, I'll just read what you said. It, okay, it, go ahead. it goes perfectly with what, what you're saying right now. Perhaps it is part of our Western rationalist bias that makes us feel like our faith will be stronger once we have sorted everything out intellectually, once we can, quote, reason it all out, end quote, like some sort of engineering schematic. Yeah. Yeah. Once we can yeah. see the blueprint, then we'll then we'll be fine and we'll get it. So what I'm challenging people to do is to go back to what St. Paul said, that when you look in the mirror, when you look in faith, it's like looking in a mirror dimly. Mm. And we have to actually not only not be uncomfortable with that, but actually embrace it, you know? And I'm not calling for a kind of like quietism, sure. you know, uh, but I'm calling for us to embrace the not yetness of faith and to the fact that there's certain things that you will never be able to resolve. You will not see the answers to them. And that doesn't mean that you can't go on. That doesn't mean that your faith is in crisis. Maybe you've convinced yourself it is because you feel like you can't move unless you can see the schematic. But uh, I say, and I'll just say one more thing. When when my kids were little, or when any kids are little, you know, the beautiful thing about little kids is you can just be like, "All right, get in the car," and they just they're like, "Okay," and they just go. Yeah. They're they're not like, where are we going? Why are we going there? How long are we going to be gone? Like, uh, you know, right. they're just like, I, I just see people carrying around little babies and they're just happy to be going anywhere and they don't ask where they're going. They're right. just like, and Christ calls us to be childlike in how we trust his will. Right. So, um, can we be a little bit like that? You know, when, when God is like, I'm taking you somewhere, you know, let's be like, okay. <laughs> I'm going for a car ride, Yeah, you know, instead of being like, where are we going? How long will we be there? Will I have time to do this when I get home? Like, you know? Yeah, I, I like to, to see the faith uh, or being a Catholic. It's, it's like a sort of an, an adventure, right? It's, um, and, <laughs> yeah. you know, it is an adventure, but um, yeah, yeah, that's, uh, I think. And again, I know there's people who are going to hear this and be like, oh, so you're saying we should ignore these things or just sure. Our... No, I'm not. But again, it's a matter of priority. Right. Um, the next chapter we're going to discuss, um, again, it's related. I think if, if you think about it, every chapter is in a sense re related to one another. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, chapter 32 is uh, True and False Dark Nights. <laughs> so yeah. he here's the thing. Yeah. We, we often hear about the dark night of the soul. Right. Um, that seems like some lofty... You know, that's some lofty kind of mystical thing that uh, we shouldn't even concern ourselves with. That's just for the saints. Right. But what, first of all, I'm just going to start off. What's, what, what is a dark night of the soul? And, and, you know, how is that different from just, say, a period of desolation in, in, in you know, in a soul? Yeah, so um, in a dark night, it's like there is a... 
so when a, when a soul and when a soul gets advanced in the spiritual life, um, there's a kind of progression uh, from the head to the heart, where um, where eventually there's a transition where and you know there's Eastern and Western traditions on this, but there's a transition where um, where the spiritual movements become more passive and contemplative. And you're moving from a field in which like human activity dominates into one where the soul is more responsive to God. And this comes through a kind of deprivation of consolations where <clears throat> um, at an earlier stage, God provides the soul with all sorts of spiritual goodies to, uh, you know, like you, like you pray and then you feel better about, you sure. feel peace. To keep them going. To keep them going. Yes. You know, you, you, uh, you offered something to God and you feel some relief afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, and this is like a final purification where God removes even those spiritual consolations to where there's literally no experience of benefit, even in the interior life to what you're doing. You don't even necessarily feel better about what you're doing spiritually and it's to completely break you away from any dependence on those things and to prepare you for the the, the final stage in spiritual life uh, moving towards the unitive stage um, now i of course I do not claim to be anywhere close to that i'm taking this from spiritual writers yes. right uh, what this chapter about though is about is how we talked earlier about saint Teresa's little way being bastardized mm -hmm. That also happens with dark nights where people will just be like, they'll go on social media like, oh, I'm going through a real dark night right now. And then they'll talk about some suffering and uh, and they really think they're going through the dark night of the soul because they're having a hard time or they're going through a normal period of spiritual desolation. Uh, and so what I was calling for here is for to people for people to stop using this term whenever they're just having a dry spell. So you will get people online that just they're simply having a dry spell in their spiritual life or they're sure. having a hard time and they say they're going through the dark night of the soul. And I'm just like, stop, like, you're <laughs> not, you yeah, know. The, it would seem the dark night of the soul, someone ex experiences that when they're actually progressing in the spiritual life, right? yeah. when they're actually, again, wrestling, they're, they're, they're really advancing in the spiritual life, yeah. right? It's not someone who, it's not, not anyone just, goes through a dark night of the soul. Yeah, and, and if somebody's like, well, that's judgmental, how do you know they're not going through a dark <laughs> night of the soul? I'm just going to say, no one who is actually going through the dark night of the soul goes on social media to complain that they're that's, going through the dark that, night of the that's, soul. That's right. That's right. <laughs> so the very fact that you do that tells me you're yeah, not. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's... Um, I, oh my I, gosh, this unitive way is such a hassle. <laughs> <laughs> you know what they say? I've I've read again. This is just book learning, but I've read yeah. that this is related to that. That bishops have to be in the unitive way. It's interesting. Like have to have, to what to be a good bishop? Or? Well, they, they should be. They, when they become a bishop, they should have been advanced in the spiritual life, right? Yeah, I, yeah. I think I guess like, that's ideally right. That'd be ph um, phenomenal. Yeah, that would be great if yeah if. It, yeah. Anyway. As it is, though, most of them need to start the purgative way. <laughs> that's that's it, right? That's right. Um, so anyway, um, yeah, no, that's uh, it's fascinating. Um, chapter thirty-five mm -hmm. again. It's related to chapter thirty-two. Um, it's called doubt and the Christian faith. Um, yeah. Interesting topic because I, I'll just ask this question: um, the topic of doubt. Can we doubt an article of the faith? What do we mean by doubt, and and can we doubt an article of the faith, or you know, some aspect of the faith? Or yeah, maybe kind so, of explain that. Right. So, um, you know, all of modern philosophy is predicated upon doubt. You know, going back to Descartes and etc. There's a kind of epistemological skepticism about our ability to know things. Um, and so it's become very entrenched and it's even seeped into Christian thought where people sometimes almost treat doubt as a virtue, mm. um, where, uh, and, and people are almost going back to the dark night. Like some people are treating the dark night as if it's a kind of doubt, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and you, you saw this a couple times with, uh, like St. Mother Teresa, where when her journals were published, where she was explaining the dark night, which I believe she went through. 
um, and people were treating as if she was doubting the faith. Right. And they're like, even Mother Teresa doubted her faith. And no, Mother Teresa was explaining the dark night sure. uh, of being deprived. And she was saying things like, I feel desolate. I don't feel you. That's what the dark night is. That's not doubting the, like M Mother Teresa wasn't like, oh, I'm really not sure if Jesus is real. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, um, so, um, so what is the relation of doubt to faith? Can we doubt? So doubt is a state of mind where it's like you're suspended between contrary propositions and you can't assent to either one. Now, sometimes you can have like negative doubt where there's just an absence of evidence for either proposition, like okay. somebody's arguing point A and point B and you're not seeing a strong case for either one. Or you can have positive doubt, which is where they both are very strong cases mm -hmm. and you still, uh, you still can't, uh, can't decide. Um, so doubt is not a denial. Um, a person who is denying something, they are saying like, I deny that this is the case. A person who's doubting is just unable to to make a uh, a, a resolution. So um, now Christianity being a revealed religion, our faith is not based on our ability to empirically judge things, right? So it says that we don't believe. It, it says in in many places in the modern catechism and Vatican One, etc that we don't believe because we have examined every proposition of faith and come to a logical demonstration that convinces the intellect. Um, we believe on the strength of it's revealed by God who mm -hmm. cannot lie. And then once we accept that, uh, logic and reason kind of step in to buttress it, right? right. So in a strict sense, there's no, there's no value in since faith is not dependent on like evidence and, ra and uh, logical demonstration, Doubt really has no place when we're discussing faith. There's no virtue in it. Now, we might be doubting, like that's certainly, you might be doubting something, but there's no like, there's no positive aspect to that. Mm -hmm. You know, there's no, there's no virtue. Um, the Catholic Encyclopedia says, doubt in regards to the Christian religion is equivalent to its rejection. <laughs> Uh, the ground of its acceptance yeah. being necessarily in every case the authority which is proposed, not the philosophical or scientific doctrines or its intrinsic demonstrability. So this means that doubt never has a positive value in Christianity. Again, I'm not saying that you might not doubt or that you might not struggle with doubt, but it never has a, uh, a, a positive value, right? Um, so doubt should not be praised. You should not be like, well, like you have spiritual leaders who are saying that like doubt is a normative aspect of the Christian. Well, you you give an example and, and, you know, understanding this correctly. Oh yeah, let's, let's it, read this. Just, just read it. I mean, it was pretty. Um, yeah. So this, this person said, let's, this is a high ranking ecclesiastical prelate who made this uh, comment. Christians who have not experienced a crisis of faith are missing something. On many occasions, I find myself in a crisis of faith. Sometimes I question Jesus and even doubted. Is this really the truth? Is it a dream? This happened when I was a boy, a seminarian, a religious, a priest, a bishop, and even now as Pope. Um, so that's a high ranking prelate who says, <laughs> says that. Um, now, you might be saying, but like you just talked about wrestling, like and that we have to embrace wrestling, right? Right. What wrestling but is, so, so wrestling is when you're like, trying to accept something and you just don't understand how it fits sure. together. Yes. It's like it's like you're moving through a dark room and you just don't see the path clearly and you're trying to find your way through. That's different from doubt. That's different from doubting. <laughs> right. To say I sometimes I've questioned Jesus and, and like that that seems perplexing to me. Yeah. It seems yeah. very perplexing yeah. to me. Yeah. And so I mean, he's saying know. here not only is he saying that he's questioned Jesus and doubted but that Every Christian is missing something if we haven't doubted uh, Jesus. I, yeah. So that's a little bit beyond mere wrestling with something. Sure. You know, th sure. this is like he's saying it's normative and even praiseworthy to, to doubt. Now, sometimes God uses doubt as a means of bringing us through. You know, we can go through a period of doubt and then God uses that. Mm -hmm. Just like I was, I was Pentecostal once and God used that, you know. 
Yeah, I, he's not. I was like, what? Yeah, I was Pentecostal once, and God used that to bring me to Catholicism. Okay. Or I was once this or that, and God That's used right. that. But that doesn't mean those things have positive sure. value. Like, that doesn't mean I would t say people, yeah, go be Pentecostal. Yeah. It's a way to God. <laughs> you know, so Absolutely. you might experience doubt. God might use that doubt. But would I ever say doubt has a positive value and that it's normative that we should all doubt? Absolutely not. That's just awful to say. Yes. Yes. Yeah. No, that was, uh, that was very revealing. Um, so let's see. I'm just going to, I'm going to go to the last chapter. Oh, good. Uh, chapter 40. And I thought it was a perfect way to end the book. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you for putting this in the book. Uh, it was, it was just a beautiful chapter. First of all, I wanted to mention how, like, what, what, what was this? Why did he send you this this uh, response? Yeah. So what, this what is, precipitated um, it? Yeah. This is um, this is uh, the, the chapter is called "Response to Robert." Mm -hmm. Robert is a longtime reader of my blog, and he's a friend, and so he wrote me a letter, uh, just expressing some difficulties he was having. Um, and I kind of address them in the letter. He's got fear that his children won't keep the faith. Mm. You know, he's um, not because there's any signs they're losing the faith, but he's just anxious, you know, uh, uh, about it. Um, he's worried about the state of the world. He's worried about the state of the church. He's worried because his own prayer uh, before the Blessed Sacrament doesn't really feel anything, you know. So he's got just various issues going on that he yes. just wrote about. And so I just wrote him a lengthy response, kind of encapsulating everything we've talked about in the, in the book. I think the last chapter really sums everything up. I, I um, think so too, yes. Yeah, which was to... Uh, <clears throat> yeah, how about I just read this paragraph here? Sure. Did you, did you have one you want me to read? I was going to read this one here. No, 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 you can read that. Yeah. yeah, so what I told him, I said, it's easy to get bogged down by the weight of the world's problems. We can feel torn as if the survival of Western civilization depends upon our own meager efforts. It sounds as though this has affected you to a degree. But we imagine our theater of action is vastly broader than it is. In actuality, it's quite small, confined to the tiny fleeting moments we retain control over. A moment so brief it's gone by the time we even conceive of it. But it is to our great benefit that the window is so small, for it puts our salvation into a context we can manage. The grand arc of my life, my eternal destiny, that of my children and friends and the will of God overarching it all, that's all too much for me to maintain in my head and heart. As the psalm says, such knowledge is too wonderful for me, far too lofty for me to reach. Thank God he does not ask me to navigate such a tremendous vessel all at once. Rather, he commits me, commits to me a single oar and tells me, row well and live. He entrusts me with a single coin and says, use this wisely. And that I can manage, especially with the aid of his grace, which enlightens my mind. The burden of our salvation is actually quite small. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. That's not to say salvation is not of tremendous import, obviously, but it is one of the paradoxes of the kingdom of God that the import of such a grave matter can be a burden of light and an easy yoke. Just because something is important does not mean it must be draining. Hmm. I am reminded of Chesterton's famous quip, angels can fly because they take themselves lightly. To achieve great things, we must become small. That includes shrinking the locus of our attention in the way that Christ suggested in the Beatitudes. And then I'll read wow. one more passage. Sure. This relates to our Lord's command to be his children. We usually interpret childlike faith to relate to trust, and this is certainly true, but I think it relates to our focus. Children are concerned only with what is before them. They take no care for tomorrow and scarcely remember yesterday. Their attention is entirely fixated upon whatever they are doing at the moment. Imagine if your own spiritual attention was so fixated on the moment. Invest that kind of focus in the here and now, and you will do better. Then I quote Christ, which of you by being anxious can add one cubit to the measure of his life? Wow. Wow. It's all there. It's all there in scripture. It's all there in the... It's in the Beatitudes. It it's really in the is. Beatitudes. <laughs> yeah. I, 
I guess one thing I would wrap up saying on this, and maybe you have other questions, but while I'm thinking about it, <clears throat> even if you don't get the book, um, I think every Catholic, especially if you're troubled by what's going on in the world and church, go back to the Beatitudes. Um, we're so familiar with the Beatitudes, we sometimes kind of like gloss over them because we're like, yeah, I've heard this. Mm -hmm. But like, man, really go back and think about these and pray about them and what would these mean if I, like, what would my life look like if I really lived the Beatitudes? It really is all there. And it's, it's with great wisdom that the Catechism says that these are the heart of the new law. And so take that to heart and go pray the Beatitudes if you're struggling. Wow. That actually, I had some final questions, but th that actually answered both oh, of them. All right. <laughs> um, um, I, I could say so much more, but I think this should do it. But I think everyone should buy the book, The Way of Life. It's available at arocapress.com under new releases. Um, you could also find it on Amazon, Barnes & Noble. And you've got a nice hardcover version, too. I do. I do, with a nice dust jacket. So um, do purchase this book. Um, it's, it's full of wisdom, um, full of practical advice. But it's, uh, it's, I think one of the themes, I mentioned this to, to, to the author, to Philip, before we started, that one of the themes I, I saw in the book is the theme of head and heart. Yes, we have, uh, you know, we need to know the faith, you know, we have intellectual reasons, etc. But also there's an aspect of the heart that we need to foster. So head and heart, not just the head, not just the heart, you know, both, we need both. Um, pick this book up. It's great. It's a great book. Thank you. Thank you for publishing it. Yeah, thank you, Philip. Thank you. It's a, it was a pleasure.